Welcome to uh, our lecture today on uh, a theology of evangelism uh, in the Old Testament. And today we're going to look primarily at uh, prophetic passages, prophets. Uh, one uh, Old Testament prophet, Isaiah particularly, and his prophecies about uh, Jesus the Messiah, and then Jonah, and uh, as uh, an evangelist, uh, how did uh, the Lord deal with Jonah, and uh, how did the Lord use him? So in this theology of evangelism, in many ways, it's just an overview, touching uh, certain uh, key passages of Scripture that uh, have stood out to me as giving us uh, an outline as to the major elements uh, of evangelism. Though that word is used primarily in the New Testament, uh, we see its roots and its foundation in the Old Testament. And so we've looked at the historical books, some sections, and we've looked at key psalms. And so in this lecture, we want to look at a couple major uh, passages that in, in great detail describe to us uh, the work of Jesus Christ. Um, to kind of uh, introduce the thought of the prophets or prophecy, we find that there are many, many uh, scriptures that in the Old Testament, uh, Genesis, uh, through all the minor prophets, um, Psalms, major prophets, uh, have predictions or insights into what's going to come thousands of years, hundreds of years later in the New Testament and the person and the work of Jesus Christ. I just want to kind of whet your appetite and set a foundation for this idea of prophecy that God revealed ideas, concepts, places uh, ahead of time, hundreds, thousands of years that we see fulfilled in Christ. And I think these prophecies are given, first of all, to validate primarily the deity of Jesus Christ, that he is God the Son. And we'll see that as we come to the New Testament. For example, in Genesis 3.15, it speaks of the seed of the woman. And uh, we find, as we get to the book of Galatians, as we find in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, the seed then becomes and fulfilled in the person of Jesus the Christ. Uh, so something that from the very first pages of the Bible, in terms of a redeemer, in terms of one that is overcoming uh, the evil one, who introduce uh, sin and, and temptation to us. We see that in Isaiah, where we will go primarily uh, in this lecture today, chapter 7, and you have your Bibles, encourage you to look at that, chapter 7 of Isaiah, verse 14, uh, that says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel. And that's uh, the verse, as we read in the Old Testament, and in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, 24, and 25, you go and read that, you'll see that this, uh, very, these very words are a description and a titling of Jesus the Christ. We find in Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, 2 Samuel chapter 7, the concept of the Son of God. And again, in Matthew 3, 17, uh, Matthew 16, 17, that uh, these, these concepts then are applied, uh, the, the title is applied to Jesus Christ. We find also in Genesis 12 uh, that the Messiah, the one coming, the Redeemer, is the son of Abraham. In Genesis 21, 12, he's the son of Isaac, as fulfilled in Luke 3, 23 and 4. He is of the tribe of Judah, according to Genesis 49, 10. We see in Isaiah, where we'll look more uh, detailed in this lecture, chapter 11, verse 1, it says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, and from his roots a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might. And again, as we get to Luke, uh, if you look at Luke 3, 23, and the other Gospels, we see that 
the, that Jesus, born in, of uh, a virgin, born in Bethlehem, is of the line or the family of Jesse, even as it is said here. In reference to being of the house of David in Jeremiah 23, 5, Psalm 132, 11, we see that also fulfilled not only in Luke 3, 23, and 31, but also Mark 9, 10. Uh, we find very specifically in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, that this promised one, this redeemer to come, is to be born in Bethlehem. And of course, we find that in Matthew uh, 21, 11, Luke 2, 4 to 7, that Jesus was in fact born in Bethlehem. Uh, we find also in Micah 5, 2 of his pre-existence, just like it is in Isaiah chapter 9, uh, verse 6 and 7, where we read, For us, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the governance will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So these obviously in Isaiah are, are terms that refer to God and to the eternality of God, and also that he is a child and he is a son. And again, in the Gospels, Matthew 1, 23 and Luke 7, 16, we see these very exact terms used to describe Jesus in his birth. I want us to look uh, specifically at Isaiah, uh, this prophecy in chapter 40, uh, 52, uh, Isaiah 52, um, and 53, uh, chapter 52, beginning for us uh, at verse uh, 13. And here, uh, through chapter 53, uh, we, we have a very clear description of the suffering of, of Jesus, uh, the suffering of the crucified one, the suffering servant. And uh, the reason we look at this, because we learn as evangelists uh, of the work of Christ, of the atonement, uh, what he actually had to go through for us to be forgiven, and therefore for us to have good news to share, that there is forgiveness, uh, there is new life, there is eternal life in Christ. And uh, the details of this are very moving. Isaiah uh, says, first of all, in verse 7, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Now this is obviously, even as Paul used in Ephesians 6, the good news uh, is that which the Christian, and particularly the evangelist, it says we shod our feet, that is, we put on the shoes of the good news, that we have good news to share. And, and this is part of our spiritual warfare, that we're not just fighting a defensive battle, as it were. We're fighting an offensive battle. We're on, as it were, the attack. We're intentionally going and proclaiming, announcing good news. And uh, we find this way back in Isaiah, seven centuries before Christ came. And then he goes on to explain or to pro prophesy the work of the Messiah, of uh, the Christ. He says, of the suffering servant, see my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings and shut their mouths because of him. For what they were told they will see, and what they have not heard they will understand. So here, again, specific words, but obviously uh, images that are taken up in the New Testament. Uh, for example, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus, Jesus explains to him that the Son of Man must be lifted up, even as, as a snake was lifted up on the pole, in reference to, to the Exodus, in reference to the, the Jewish people's sin and rebellion, and finding healing as they looked 
uh, to the pole that Moses lifted up, that they were healed. But here also we have the imagery that uh, the servant will act wisely and will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. And though we don't think of the Christ in a sense of exaltation, Christ was lifted up. We see that image again. So uh, my point of theology of evangelism, what concepts are repeated over and over? And again, they point to Christ. They point to the major themes uh, of the scripture, uh, which for us is the content of the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. So Christ was lifted up, and even though lifted up on a cross, he died. Ultimately, he was exalted because of that humiliation and that obedience. But also we find in this verse uh, 24 uh, a, a description of, of that being lifted up. Uh, he, it says that, that they were, there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. And uh, again, this is deeply... Uh, uh, it could be troubling or disturbing or so descriptive uh, of the, the, the agony and the suffering and the brutality that Jesus went through on the cross, that he didn't even look human because of the beating and, and the cursing and the scorn and the thorns on his brow. So um, these uh, prophecies, uh, again, not only reinforce what we find in the New Testament, but to me they verify this is the plan of God. This isn't an accident. This is God's determined plan that a servant uh, would suffer and would die for us. In chapter 53, it goes on, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground that had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their face. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. So it wasn't only the physical dimension of suffering, but the rejection, the being despised, the being uh, cursed, uh, the, the low esteem, the humiliation uh, of his death that, that the Savior uh, went through for us on the cross. And again, um, these prophecies are uh, reinforcing to us that the work of Christ was very costly. It was costly to, to the Savior, to Jesus, to his Father, who had to witness this. But uh, the point was that he was accomplishing something uh, for us because of the, the grossness of sin, the hideousness of sin, the, the great and uh, beyond measure penalty that uh, sin, our sin, the sin of all humanity, our individual sin, the corporate sin of all humanity, that Christ went through this great work and agony that we would be forgiven, that the debt would be paid. It goes on to say, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. And again, the, uh, uh, further description, deeper understanding of uh, the great extent uh, that that Jesus went through in this passage, these verses particularly, receiving the punishment of the Father. The wrath of, the, of God the Father was poured out on his Son. And the point was, his punishment, which was really due us, but he took our punishment, brought us peace. It's the only way to peace, that holiness would be satisfied that the just demands of a holy God could somehow be met. And the point is, all of humanity, all of us, we couldn't meet it, individually or corporately. But his son, the Holy One, 
could meet those demands, that his righteousness and his holiness was greater than our sin. And by his wounds, we are healed. And I believe primarily that's focusing upon uh, our redemption, our sin. And uh, it can be applied physically, but uh, it's primarily that we are, our, our souls are healed. We are, we are forgiven. The, the debt is paid. It goes on in Isaiah to describe, uh, again, theologically, shifting from the atonement to those who need to be atoned for. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So we learn from verse 6, the nature of humans. We're like sheep, and sheep are always going astray. They're, they're wandering away from the master. Uh, they're, they're focused on themselves, filling their own appetite, but not following the shepherd. And uh, so the Lord, again, has forgiven the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He has led like a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before it shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation pros- protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. Again, many concepts, many ideas here about Christ. The oppression uh, there was no pr- protest, it says, of his death. He was cut off from the land of the di- living. And again, for the transgressions of my people, he was punished. So we have there the substitutionary action of Christ, stepping in for us, taking our place. And this he did in silence, with, without protesting, without complaining. He did this says he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. And so we know that he was placed, his body was placed in a tomb of a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea. We know that Nicodemus and Joseph went and took Christ's body off the cross and, and buried him on that Good Friday before the sun was set. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offering and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he had suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, And he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So again, his suffering, uh, his non-complaining, but it also points to the resurrection, uh, the portion among the great, dividing the spoils, Uh, Seeing the light of life, uh, which uh, is an expression used in various psalms of eternal life. Uh, He will see the light of life and be satisfied. And uh, our Lord is satisfied. And it is amazing, if we think of the, the gospel, what it's saying, he's satisfied and that we are redeemed. He is satisfied in that his work was successful. And it brought redemption to all who would believe. And uh, hopefully, as we think of the gospel, as we ponder the the beautiful uh, truths of God, that Christ is satisfied in his work, that, that it has accomplished what he wanted. It has provided uh, atonement for all who will believe and be born of a spirit, and, uh, and, and know him personally. Come to know and share in the light of life. So, uh, again, uh, this is an uncomparable, really, passage, both Old and New Testament, and the extensiveness of the description of what Christ went through on the cross in a physical sense, uh, 
in, in a personal sense, he was uncomplaining. He, he, he was submissive, but he was victorious. And what he did was accepted by the Father, approved by the Father, and he was granted life eternal, which again, if you study theologically, that life that, that, that he had in the resurrection was a gift from the Father, was resident in his being as the Son of God, and was the power of holiness and the Holy Spirit. So again, the Trinity of God working in unity in the resurrection because it accomplished what God wanted it to accomplish, a payment, a sufficient payment for the sins of all mankind. So in the Old Testament, we we have these deep and profound uh, texts that uh, are fulfilled in in, in the, 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 the death and the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. Uh, totally God, totally man. We'll see that as we move forward. But uh, evangelist, <laughs> uh, we, we look here and we can see over and over, almost every verse has a, a theme, an idea, a revelation that is consistent from the book of Genesis all the way through the Bible. As we reflect then on uh, the prophetic uh, books of the Old Testament, Isaiah obviously has a very profound and lengthy description of Christ's uh, death and accomplishing in that death an atonement for the sin of the world. Uh, other uh, ideas and concept come in small bites. As we said, as we began the lecture, there are many texts that are prophetic in detail about a, a person, a place, an event. And uh, one of the minor prophets, Micah, Chapter 5, verse 2 says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, uh, one of you will come for me, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. And we find that, in fact, from this uh, small village uh, in uh, Palestine today, Bethlehem, the Messiah, Jesus, was born. And we find that in Matthew 22, 1, Luke 2, 4 to 7, particularly. Um, but also in this text, it's not just a place, which in itself is very prophetic and, uh, and amazing. A little place out of all the places, the Messiah would be born in this small, obscure village. But also, it, it talks about uh, the pre existence, in a sense, of the Messiah in this prophecy when it uses the phrase from ancient times, which actually could also be translated from days of eternity or from out of eternity into time. And uh, we find this in Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, the fulfillment referring to Jesus, the resurrected Christ. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is before all things. So again, the concept of deity, the concept of pre-existence. So the scriptures, again, uh, are abundant in uh, prophetic passages detailing the coming of the Messiah, which as we go back to in scripture, Genesis 3, 15, the seed of the woman, this one to be born, this uh, descendant of, of Eve will crush the head of the serpent. So the scriptures from many angles and many details describe a coming Redeemer. And obviously in Isaiah we have the deep description of the work of the Redeemer of Christ on the cross. We want to look at another part of evangelism, not the one who provides the Savior, but the messengers. And of course the classic minor prophet is Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. Um, So here God is using a messenger to take this good news in this sense of repentance. Repent or you'll be destroyed, but it's good news. You won't be destroyed if you repent. But Jonah, for a number of reasons, primarily because he didn't like the Ninevites, he hated them, 
he was afraid of them. They were a world power, and obviously he was in a small uh, uh, Palestine, which wasn't very big, and he's a, not a very big person, and he's called to do this uh, job that's way over his head, and really out of fear, I think fear for his life and hatred for the assignment, he went in the geographical other direction. Instead of going east, he went west, and he was headed for, as it were, uh, the west coast of what is modern-day Spain, which was on is on the Atlantic Ocean. So he kind of went the farthest, in his mind, he was going the farthest place west. He could go kind of the edge of the world, uh, we know, in those days, because of fear he was running from God. Um, and then we know the story, he was thrown into the, the sea, and a large fish swallowed him, and it says... In chapter 2, from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord, Yahweh, his God. And he said, in my distress, I called to Yahweh, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirling about me, all your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. Uh, The waters engulfed me. They threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed is wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. To the earth beneath barred me and forever. But you, Yahweh my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was embedded, ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. So for the prophet uh, who was disobedient and ran the other way, and then was swallowed by the fish and was thrown into the depths. Uh, Before he really went and became a messenger of good news, of salvation, he himself was saved. He himself was delivered from his own disobedience, his own rebellion, his own lack of trust in, in Yahweh God. And remember in our lecture, that's the personal name God revealed himself to, to Moses. And the name is to be remembered by the great I am has become the he is what we need in our life, in our personal experience. God is not just big and sees over all. He wants to be our personal Lord and Savior. And that's communicated through the term Yahweh, his personal name. And so here in Jonah, uh, the, the disobedient one became obedient to salvation and knew the joy of the Lord had the experience of the God delivering him out of death. And uh, then in chapter 3, then the word of the Lord came again to Jonah. A second time he said, Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. And Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. So again, some very key ideas here. Here we, we have answered prayer. We have personal experience and salvation then becoming a minister of, as it were, the gospel. And that ministry is, is out of obedience to the voice of God. We hear God. We believe God speaks to us through meditation, through reading, through a sermon, uh, through uh, however it comes to us. But we know in our spirit, God says, I want you to do this. And it may scare us, as it did Jonah initially, It may be overwhelming. It may be going someplace we don't want to go, going to people we don't even like. But he obeyed. He went to Nineveh, and uh, Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, proclaiming. And uh, that is the, the primary method of evangelism, to, to share a message publicly to speak to an individual, to preach to a large cloud, to have a podcast, uh, to send a message of some kind, whether spoken or written, proclaim is announcing a message. 
that has content. There is a story about this message. And uh, we, we'll learn more of the story of the gospel. But I'm sure that when Jonah was proclaiming the message, uh, he could share about what salvation was like. What, what does Yahweh do for you? He could share, share the story of the fish. I have read somewhere that uh, maybe being in the belly of a fish for a few days, his skin had been bleached. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Maybe it happened. Maybe that his actual physical appearance was somewhat a, a, an attraction, not necessarily attractive, but an attraction. What happened to that guy? Why is he, you know, bleached out being, you know, Middle Eastern person? What happened to him? And he has a story to tell about his own hearing God's voice, disobeying God. And so his proclamation as he went throughout Nineveh uh, was to, uh, to, that Nineveh was going to be overthrown uh, and the Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sack, sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, sat down in the dust, and this is a proclamation by the decree of the king. And, and then all of everyone is to fast. Everyone is to repent. Um, everyone is to call on, on, on God urgently. And so that is what they did. And uh, God relented, it says. God saw what they had done, verse 10 of chapter 3, how they turned from their evil ways. He relented, did not bring on the destruction that he had threatened them. So uh, here, uh, the, the, in a sense, the evangelist of the Old Testament, uh, a story, God chooses individuals. God uses people to share his message of salvation. And the, the, the experience of first, what about your salvation? What do you know about God's deliverance, of God's rescue, of God's healing, of God's salvation for you? Jonah knew he had a story to tell. But uh, he, secondly, as then he heard again, and he obeyed, obedience to the call. Uh, not that one, you know, where we're going is where we want to go. It's where God sends us, what God tells us that we do. And he did that. But then in chapter 4, uh, some amazing things. And the, the first thing I want to note in chapter 4 is... Uh, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong and became angry. So his personal response was, look, these people I don't like, you know, they've, they've uh, repented. And, and God has relented. And they are saved. And uh, even though his personal prejudice and bias uh, existed, God still used him. And, uh, but the point is, God loves all people. All people matter to God. God wants all people to be saved. And so jo Jonah finally says, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Um, and so what we learn here theologically is what is God like? What is Yahweh like? And it's consistent from the Old Testament, from what he taught uh, Moses and Abraham and and David, and now Jonah. God is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, who relents from sending calamity. God does not want to send calamity. He wants to send salvation. And this is the good news. This is the good news today. No matter how evil anyone could be, any society could be, any group of people could be, God wants to be compassionate and, and forgiving and restorative and give life, not death. This is the God of the Bible. The final uh, note about what we might learn here in verse 11 of chapter 4, uh, Jonah says, and I should not have concern for, the, uh, excuse me, God is speaking, and should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell the right hand from their left, and also many animals. So again, this highlights, in a sense, in a theology of evangelism, the theology of God. 
Who is the God of the Bible? Uh, what is God like? How will God act? And uh, because of who God is, we are to respond to the God of the Bible in obedience, as Jonah did, even though he, he didn't like, like that. So uh, some of the questions, I think, for us in a contemporary setting of this theology, uh, first of all, thinking about Jonah, uh, asking ourselves, what is the state of our own uh, prejudice or lack thereof, we hope, in, in terms of ethnicity or ethnic relations or groups of people, uh, whether we speak to the church as a whole or to ourselves in, in our own lives, are we prejudiced? How are we prejudiced? Is there somewhere we won't go, someone we wouldn't go to, a group of people that we wouldn't go to, that uh, we don't uh, emulate Jonah here. We, we need to be different than Jonah. We need to be willing uh, to go and learning to love and care about all people, no, no matter their education, their ethnicity, their geography, their language, uh, their economic status, their mental status. Uh, we need to be willing to go. I think this highlights that God is not prejudiced. You know, even though the Ninevites were an enemy of Israel, uh, God was uh, wanting them uh, to be delivered from the calamity that was coming. In terms of ministry setting, where is God asking you to go? Uh, geography, ethnicity, where is God asking you to go? To me, these are some of the questions that come up uh, in, in terms of Jonah, the evangelist or the lack of being the, the good news bearer. He had good news to share uh, because he knew God. And that's the point. We want people to know the God of the Bible, Yahweh God. Uh, Yahweh saves. That's the name of Jesus. Jesus means Yahweh saves, and we'll be moving to that in our next lecture. But let's learn from Jonah. Even though he didn't do it right, we can learn and not make those mistakes and truly enjoy uh, serving God and seeing many come to Christ. As we uh, conclude our lecture on uh, the, the minor prophets, as it were, uh, we want to take a kind of a whole uh, review thought or thought about the Old Testament and evangelism. Uh, what, what is evangelism in the Old Testament? Uh, certainly it's proclaiming a message, but uh, there is a great emphasis on the Old Testament of uh, God, the God of the Israeli people, Yahweh God, uh, uh, inviting people uh, to come and see what Israel is like, what God has done among these people. And a classic example of this is found in 1 Kings chapter 10, when at the really apex of Solomon's rule, or the, the kingships really of all the kings of Israel, um, this queen of Sheba, which is on the, uh, the continent of Africa, uh, she comes to visit Solomon. So look at 1 Kings in your Bible, chapter 10. When the queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and his relationship to Yahweh, she came to test Solomon with hard questions. Arriving at Jerusalem with a very great caravan, with camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold, precious stone. She came to Solomon and talked with him about all that she had on her mind. Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. When the queen of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Solomon and the palace that he had built, the food on the table, the seating of the officials, the attending servants in their robes, his cupbearers, and the burnt offerings he made at the temple of Yahweh, she was overwhelmed. She said to the king, The report I heard in my country about your achievements and your wisdom is true, but I did not believe these things until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told me in wisdom and wealth 
You have far exceeded the report I heard. How happy your people who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Praise be to Yahweh your God, who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel. Because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he has made you, you king to maintain justice and righteousness. So uh, this is a tremendous picture and testimony of uh, what was communicated to uh, Moses and the children of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 28. I encourage, encourage you to read that. We, we know that as the, the blessing and the curse. If you obey, if you disobey. And uh, Israel, uh, under the rule of Solomon, displays the, the, the promises made by Yahweh to Moses and the children of Israel if they would obey God, if they would obey God. And uh, again, it affects uh, all of life. It, it affects uh, uh, wisdom and wealth. Uh, people are happy. Uh, the, the officials, the, the clothing, the order, the food, everything is abundance and everything is beautiful. Everything is orderly and everything seems to bring joy and happiness. And to me, the key of this at the end of the really the, the first long paragraph is uh, that what Solomon showed her was not just the food and the officials and the clothing and the cupbearers and the wisdom, but it says, and the burnt offerings he made at the temple of Yahweh, she was overwhelmed. And I think putting this last, in a sense, puts it at the center, the focus, that all of these things, all of the, the people, the abundance, the prosperity, the wisdom, the beauty that was being experienced under Solomon's leadership was because he also was worshiping God. He was worshiping the Lord. The burnt offerings, the whole burnt offerings, a picture of complete dedication. My life is completely uh, given over to Yahweh, to following Him, to obeying Him, to serving Him, to worshiping Him. And uh, this is the source of, a, of the abundant life. As John said, or Jesus said in John 10, I came that you would have life and you would have it abundantly. At this point, the Israelites were enjoying the abundance of God. Um, the other, uh, I think, strong element to, to emphasize here is that um, the Queen of Sheba, having heard these stories, was motivated, uh, was compelled uh, to come and see, traveling hundreds if not thousands of miles, bringing a caravan. Of course, she had the resources to do that. But in all that she had, and the good life she had as a queen, or the resources she had as, as a queen, there was something that was even more attractive than what she had. And she wanted to find, I believe, the source. Uh, to, to, to First of all, see, are these so stories true? Are they true of Solomon? And she found out they were more true than she thought. They were greater than she thought. They were better than she thought. But also, what was the source? How did this happen? She was a queen. She was no doubt wise. She had resources. She had money. She had servants. She had resources. But nothing compared to what Solomon had. And uh, again, I think the credit is that uh, he made the, the burnt offerings he made at the temple of Yahweh. She was overwhelmed. And uh, uh, she gives praise at the end, verse 9. Praise be to Yahweh your God who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel. Because of Yahweh's eternal love for Israel, he has made your, you king to maintain justice and righteousness. And so, you know, a message that it seems in our world that we've lost is the relationship between uh, an eternal, powerful, loving God who rules and can rule in our lives 
and justice and righteousness on earth. We have, we've left God out in our world. It's very evident in the U.S. And I'm sure in many countries we've separated a loving, eternal, moral God from righteous rule among mankind. And so we don't have justice. We don't have fairness. We don't have uh, freedom. Uh, we have all the opposites because we have left God out. But when God <laughs> is put at the center of life, and that was his point to Israel in Deuteronomy 28, when you hear me, when you obey me, you will be blessed. You will flourish. You will multiply. You will prosper. And uh, so in the Old Testament, it seems uh, a thrust, certainly, of proclaiming the good news is illustrated by the Queen of Sheba coming to see. Come and see what God has done. Come and see the God of Israel. Come and see what Yahweh has done, the one we worship, the one that we are fully devoted to, that we give our burnt offerings to. See and hear the wisdom. See and hear the justice, the righteousness, the prosperity that comes when one's life is ordered, directed by the God of heaven, who uh, is obviously one who wants to bless, who uh, w wants to uh, prosper his children. Again, verse 9, she said, the queen of Sheba, praise be to Yahweh your God, who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel. So here again, that God has delighted in Solomon. And Solomon receiving the wisdom and guidance of God has led Israel into their greatest days of prosperity and happiness. So the principle that I want to emphasize is the principle of come and see. And obviously, many churches, many ministries have what we call the attraction model. Come and see what the Lord has done. Come to church. Um, my challenge uh, is, as we say, come to church. Uh, what are people seeing? Uh, are, uh, my concern is they see a performance. They see a program. Even as A.T. Tozier wrote years ago in The Knowledge of the Holy that his fear was the church had given itself to the program and instead of to the life of Christ, the one that delights in us, the one who, even as Jonah had experienced, he saved him. He had a story to tell of God saving a disobedient unworthy, running away prophet, God delivered him when he called out to the Lord. For by faith are you saved through grace. It's not of yourself, it is a gift of God. So whether we see in Isaiah the, the work of the atonement and the suffering Christ, we see in Jonah a personal testimony of one who God saved and sent to those who also needed to be saved with a message that they too needed to repent. But when they did, they found a loving, compassionate, forgiving God who wanted for them what he had given to Solomon and what he had given to Israel. Uh, uh, delighting in God, <laughs> happiness in life, prosperity, uh, as we would say, even wealth. But it, it comes by delighting in God. And uh, so this was the invitation in the Old Testament. Come and see what Yahweh God has done. So as we reflect here in a theology of evangelism, a theology in the Old Testament, what are the patterns, what are the, the consistent things we see? And first of all, what do we see consistently about God? He is the creator God. He is the God of promise. He is the God of uh, redemption. He is loving and kind and forgiving and uh, compassionate, not wanting any to perish. And uh, these are the things we'll carry on into the New Testament. But from the Old Testament, they have already been experienced. <laughs> They've already been revealed. They've, it's already been communicated. 
uh, through Jonah, through uh, the, what he learned about God. I knew, uh, I knew you were going to be forgiving. You were going to relent. You're compassionate. You're kind. Um, what do we learn about mankind? Even as Jonah, the rebellion, the running away one. Uh, Adam and Eve, what do we learn? David, uh, you know, his selfish, sinful life. Um, what do we learn about their consequences, the effects of sin? Um, so uh, as we develop, as you develop, as in this course I'm challenging you to develop and working on as you're reading the scriptures, what are the consistent themes? What are the consistent themes in the Bible about God, his character and behavior, about mankind, his character and behavior, about how God has initiated salvation and what it has cost God to bring salvation to us. And um, the also, in a sense, the, the, here again in this final lesson of 1 Kings, that we are to be inviting people, not just to church, but as it were, into our lives, into friendships, into relationships, that they can see God at work in us, even as they can see God at work in Jonah. That uh, we, we want to share with others our lives as well as the message, the message about God. Who is God? What is he like? And that in the end of the day, because he is loving, compassionate, gracious, he is a forgiving God. And just as he saved and delivered Jonah, and gave him new life, just as he, uh, in a sense, delivered Nineveh, just as he prospered Solomon, as we delight in the Lord, as we follow him, as we seek the Lord, he will bless. He is a God of blessing. So, in summary, uh, from looking at uh, some key passages in the Old Testament, as we're looking to build a theology of evangelism, uh, we're asking ourselves, what, what are the major themes? What are we learning about God's uh, re redemption from uh, the uh, creation to the fall and the problems created in the fall, uh, the alienation that man has from himself, from God, from other people, uh, the issue of physical death, the issue of uh, the distortion of his rule uh, in the in the world, over all of creation, all of that because of sin. God sets into motion uh, his promises and people uh, to carry out those promises. People who, like Abraham, are people of faith. People who approach God uh, not as Abel, I mean not as Cain, but as Abel through sacrifice and through the need of atonement, and this is uh, highlighted in Isaiah 53 with the, the, the full and amazing description of what Christ ultimately did, but of his personal sacrifice of Emmanuel, God with us, that promised Messiah uh, being an atonement, a sufficient payment for the sins of the world. So again, uh, I want us to read, you'll have assignments, other readings, but uh, look at the scriptures, the life-giving word of God, and find those consistent themes that inform us what is really necessary uh, for our salvation. Uh, we have that uh, uh, beautiful passages in the Psalms that speak of uh, the, the heartfelt consequences of sin, the heartfelt reality of blessing that, that God gives to those who are forgiven. The, the really in Psalm 130 ends with the promise of full redemption, full redemption, that God himself will do this. He himself will redeem Israel. Even as Peter said later, Christ himself in his body on a tree bore our sin. Uh, God's promise in Thessalonians, the end of the first Thessalonians, we will be whole body soul, and spirit. Uh, these are the promises of God and, and really detail for us the message of salvation, what ultimately we should believe 
receive and, and, and also what we preach, what we preach. So um, just uh, as we close this lecture, uh, asking ourselves again uh, some very key questions as you take notes, as you reflect, as you read, what do we learn about God, his character, his nature, and the way God acts, the way God works in the world? Uh, another huge question as you build theology is, what is mankind like? What, what, are, what are people like? Even as Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray. What do we see in the life of Jonah? Uh, what do we see in the life of David? We see this, uh, in a sense, moving away from God. So what do we learn about the effects of sin? What, what does sin really do in, in our life? And how does it keep us from God? Uh, what do we learn about God's initiative in redemption? God's word came to Jonah. Uh, God's word came to the prophets. God initiating uh, redemption. And what are God's methods to redemption? How is it that God does reme uh, redeem? through sacrifice. Um, and as evangelists, as we move forward, how can we apply these principles and, and build ourselves uh, a philosophy of evangelism? How are we going to reach people? How are we going to communicate the message of the gospel? And again, this is the challenge of the course to building a theology of evangelism that is built out of Scripture and these eternal uh, principles that can help us uh, all through our lives. So uh, thank you, and that is the end of this lecture.